So today's program, uh, so as I said, that's uh, day five of uh, the Golem Academy. So it's uh, a bonus session. It's um, something which is brand new compared to last year because we've been improving the Unreal workflow uh, with the release of Golem 8. So we figured we had enough content to speak about this and uh, make a specific session for people who would be interested in Unreal. So we're going to start uh, going through the installation uh, process and first launch uh, because it's maybe less intuitive than what we have uh, in Maya at the moment. Um, and we will tackle the two different workflows we, we have, um, which is first one is replaying a cache. So that means we create a simulation from Maya, but we're able to use Unreal to render that. So it means that we're going to export the cache from Maya and bring it into Unreal. So that's the first workflow. The second workflow is we are actually able to get real-time crowd simulation and interact with it within Unreal. So this is what I called their simulation replay. And um, so we'll speak about uh, that workflow here. We also go through um, how to use Unreal Blueprints to interact with that simulation replay. And um, we can even cache export um, simulation results uh, from the uh, simulation node from uh, Unreal. And um, uh, if we get some time at the end of the session, I'm also going to uh, have a word about this as well. Uh, so today's session is going to be slightly uh, shorter. Well, slightly. It's going to be shorter than uh, the usual session. It's supposed to be two hours. So we'll see where we'll be uh, in two hours and uh, if I was able to get uh, most of it covered. Uh, and we're going to make a break, uh, you know, um, um, at, um, at the middle. So in an hour, we're going to make a 10 minute break. Great. So um, let's make sure first that uh, we download the right tools. So I'm going to uh, go out of this here and without, um, you know, launching even uh, Unreal, um, let's make sure that you go on the uh, package, the Golem package page. So you can go on packages.golem.com and we're going to download two uh, different components. One is the Golem plugin for Unreal. So if you go to packages.golem.com, it should um, you know, show you a list of different stuff that you can grab. So plugin for USD, for Houdini, for 3ds Max, Katana. Within that list, check um, the Golem plugin for Unreal. Uh, currently with 8.1.3, we're supporting two versions of Unreal. One is 427, which is the latest 27, um, the latest four major um, release of Unreal. And uh, they also have been um, you know, um, releasing recently 5.0. So make sure that you download uh, the right one for your Unreal version. So if you're using 427, make sure you download the right package. And actually also make sure that you're downloading the fixed version, which is called 8.1.3.1. So you may notice that there are four links. There's links to download 8.1.3. So Golem 8.1.3 for Unreal 4 and Golem 8.1.3 for Unreal 5. But you really want to grab 8.1.3.1, which is a fixed version in which we recently fixed um, a small bug related to layout. So really, really make sure that you are downloading one of those versions. So here in my case, I'm going to use Unreal 427. So I'm going to download uh, Golem 427-8131. And the second thing we would like to download is uh, the character back. So if I go a bit um, above in that same page, there's a section called Golem Character Pack and Samples. And we can see we've got the Golem Character Pack for Maya, but we also got the Golem Character Pack for Unreal Engine. So we can also grab that one here. The package is called Golem Character Pack for Unreal 8.1.3. It's not a big deal if it's not 8.1.3.1 here. 8.1.3.1 is just a fixed version, but it's mostly 8.1.3. So everything will work with 8.1.3, but we just want for Unreal to have 8.1.3.1, but for the Character Pack, we're good. So make sure you don't know those two packages. And uh, when we're good with this, we're going to start Unreal. So if you uh, haven't created, if you don't have any project yet, I start, uh, you know, um, opening Unreal, create a blank new project. Into that project, I will be able to install the Golem character pack. So it will be available for that specific project. And I will also install the Golem plugin.
So let's open the Epic Games Launcher here. And uh, I'm going to launch Unreal 4, 4, sorry, 427, which is the one I've been installed. So I'm using the, uh, once again, I'm using the Epic Game Launcher here. I went into the Unreal, uh, Unreal Engine section, into the library section. Here I've got multiple versions being installed, but the one I want to use today is going to be 427. So I'm going to launch it. So it will open the Unreal Editor. And uh, I will create a new project because right now I don't have any project yet. So if I want to create the simplest project ever, I can just grab um, into the project categories, the games one, go into next here. I can just create a blank uh, template. I can press next. Um, I want to use Blueprint and not C++ there. Uh, I want to make sure that retracing is disabled because in 420, well, at least if you're using 427, make sure ray tracing is disabled because there is a bug with skeletal meshes, which is what we use in Golem and the ray tracing. But if you're using 5.0, it doesn't make any difference. And um, here I also pick that I don't want any starter content. So I'll make sure that my project will be empty. I don't have any asset in it. So it's going to be stored into um, my documents here, apparently. So. So far, so good. And I just provide a name. So Academy 2022. I can create a project and it means that Unreal will write into that specific directory here, a new directory called Academy 2022. And this is where we'll be installing the character pack and the Golem plugin. So let's create the project. So we will create the right um, directory list. And it will initialize um, Unreal. And as we can see here, the project is um, brand new. It doesn't have much stuff, just a light, a floor, and that's more or less what it is. If I look into the content browser, which is listing what we are available as an asset um, into, um, you know, into the project here, there's nothing. So we're going to also change this um, to make some uh, data available here. So hopefully in the meantime, I was uh, creating a new project. Um, the download are now uh, executed. So if you go into your download section, now you end up into um, two zip file. One is Golem for Unreal 8131 and your version of Unreal right after it's a zip. So you can just uh, you know unzip it and extract it into uh, its own directory. Um, once it's extracted into its own directory, you'll get a plugin architecture. So I won't go into too much detail here, but this is how uh, it looks like. There's a specific Unreal plugin file called uplugin extension. So yeah, just make sure it's all going to contain into its own directory. And if we also unzip the Golem character pack, we also end up with a directory called Golem character pack for Unreal 813. And uh, this one here has a content subdirectory. And if we just dive in it, it has Golem characters. And then for every single character of the character pack, we've got our entry. And um, let's say we want to take a look at what we have. We have um, for every single textures and materials, we have U assets, which are unreal assets. So we've been converting the Maya character pack with all the textures, the shader, the variation uh, as unreal assets so they can be used the exact same way within Unreal. Great. So how do we install the plugin first? So I um, open a new tab. I'll go into where my Unreal project has been um, uh, created. So for in my situation here, it's within my documents uh, subdirectory called Unreal Project. It has the Academy 2022 directory. So I can open this. I can probably close Unreal in the meantime. I want to create a new directory, which is a, um, sorry, let's remove the launcher. So that's a, a um, directory which is recognized by Unreal, which is called plugins. So I just want to, into my uh, tree, uh, into my project uh, architecture here, I want to create a new directory called plugins with an uppercase P. So, it has a specific syntax, so make sure that you are following it so it's recognized by Unreal properly. So plugins uh, with a, so pure role with an uppercase P there. 
I want to go into my download and grab my plugin. So Golem for Unreal 8131 for Unreal 427. I just want to grab this and put it into uh, the plugins um, directory. So now into my project, there's a new plugin which is available, which is Golem for Unreal 8131. Great. And I also want to install my character pack while I'm at it. So you may notice that within your project, there's a content directory as well, which is the same than the one we're having into the character pack. We've got a content. So up to you, either you can grab the content um, directory, that, um, the directory, copy it and paste it into your project. And as they have the same name, you will be copied below. Or you can just dive into the content directory here, copy Golem characters. This is what I'll do. So I'll actually cut going to content there and paste it. So now within the content directory of my project, there's a Golem characters directory with all my characters in it as U assets, so as Unreal assets. Great, so we're nearly done, um, but actually something is uh, missing here. This is why I was saying that it's slightly more complicated uh, to install for Unreal than Maya. Uh, because, you know, Maya is probably here for 25 years now. Um, so there are plenty of uh, stuff around it uh, to build plugin with, uh, where Unreal is probably um, more, uh, it's actually newer, slightly newer. So there's one dependency which is not available by default into the Unreal uh, distribution, which we have to install ourselves. So it's a Python dependency. Uh, all the UI that we're having within Golem, they rely on the library called uh, Qt, and we actually want to install that dependency for Unreal. So to do this, I actually have to, um, as I obviously I don't know exactly uh, what's the, uh, the the process to do it. Usually what I do is I go uh, connect to unreal.golem.com. It brings me to um, the documentation regarding the Unreal plugin. So once again, it's um, the shortcut is unreal.golem.com. And um, I can go into the installation. And um, like the first line of the installation tells me that I need to install dependency to the Unreal Engine environment. So um, it says that what we need to do is to install the P, uh, PySide Python module. And to do this, we need to go into the Unreal uh, Engine installation directory into a specific place. Uh, so you can see here, this is your Unreal Engine, the install directory, engine, binaries, third party, Python 3, Win64. So we're going to actually navigate until that um, uh, specific directory here, and we'll have to run those commands here. Um, if we don't run those commands, we, won't not, we will not be able to open the tools uh, within Unreal. So we will be able to create the nodes and populate the nodes by hand, but having the tools is you know, way more convenient to be able to interact uh, with Unreal without having to type in stuff. So let's do this. We need to go into the Unreal Engine di main directory. So I go into, probably it's installed into C, program files, epic. I want to go into the exact same version than the one I'm uh, using. Oh, and someone is telling me that it's enabled by default in UE5. That's something I didn't know. So if you're using Unreal 5, probably you don't have to do this, which is great. Uh, as I'm using 4, I'll have to do it on my side. So I go into 427, then it tells me to go into engine, binaries, third party, Python 3, and Win64. So this is where um, Python 3 is installed for Unreal. So this is um, uh, the interpreter, which is used when you're typing anything which is Python related into Unreal, 5, into Unreal 4 or 5. So uh, it means that we want to install a specific dependency for that Python uh, setup there. So I'm going to copy this pass here. I'll go into a command mode there, which I want to open as an administrator. So I just right click on, so I, I typed command uh, in my search bar, right click on it, run as administrator. And it's just opening a new uh, you know, command prompt. So what I want to do is first um, 
navigate to my directory. So at the moment, when we open the command box, by default, it opens into the Windows settings. So I want to change the directory. To change the directory, I can use CD, um, which means change directory. And I can uh, paste my path here. So the way to paste a path that you just copied is by pressing the right click of your mouse. By pressing the right, the right click, is just copy what you have into your um, a clipboard and we can press enter. So now we can see that as soon as we press enter, we are not into C Windows System 32 anymore. We're into the directory of Python 3 Win64. And now I can just copy those as we have into the documentation. Probably we can copy them into the chat box if you haven't opened that. Um, um that page yet so we can copy you the actual path where you need to go and uh, the actual comments so first i want to upgrade uh, a tool called pip also called pip which is used to install packages so it just takes a couple of seconds when it's done it just tells you that it successfully installed um pip whatever version so that's the first thing we want to do and the second thing we want to do is to copy that second line here. Press right click to install it. So it's going to collect, uh, download uh, the Qt dependency from the web, install it. And once again, once it's done, it just tells you that it successfully installed beside whatever versions and uh, Shibokan, um, whatever version. Great. So I just. Um, yeah, just let Alex um, share the actual line if you want to grab them from the chat box. Else I consider that you probably install it on your side already. And uh, we can move forward with this. So great. Um, it also tells that we need to uh, load two plugins uh, in the project, uh, which will be the scripting utilities and the uh, uh, editor script plugin as well. So we're going to do this. So let's start Unreal again. Now we've been installing the Golem plugin for Unreal 427 into a specific project. Um, we've been installing uh, the Qt dependency. So we're probably good to go now and, um, and uh, go to the next step. So either you can relaunch um, Unreal from, uh, the, you know, from the launcher here, or you can directly open it, uh, open your project from my projects now that we've been creating that project. So let's open the project here. It will directly open 427 with uh, the right settings. And now we may see that uh, we've got some uh, messages coming from Golem, which says that, um, well, in my situation here, I didn't install the license. Uh, but here, I don't have the license, so I'm uh, in the learning edition mode uh, at the moment. Uh, we also end up with a Golem library button in the shelf, which means that the Golem plugin has been uh, detected properly. And if it's not been detected properly, you can actually go into edit plugins and start typing Golem and make sure that it's enabled. So if it's not enabled, you can just check, box, uh, check the checkbox here. Um, I probably would have to check why uh, give me a second. I just want to, uh, what's the command to check, uh, get environment variable in Python. Ah, that's it. I just want to check uh, exactly why my license is not detected because I was supposed to have installed it. Uh, it's Golem. If you've been installing the license for Maya, you will not have that issue. Uh, because you can use the same license for Maya and um, and uh, for Unreal. Okay, so that's not pointing for on the right file. So that's that's my problem. Uh, never mind. I just uh, will have some missing meshes, but fair enough. Um, also, I was referring to the fact that we need to also enable um, two uh, other plugin, so which is the editor scripting utility. So if you just type script uh, into the search box you end up with the editor scripting utility. So let's enable it. Uh, it says that's a beta version. So uh, I, I'll enable it anyway. And also the Python editor script plugin, make sure that it's enabled. Great. So as soon as now the scripting 
tools are loaded, the Goan plugin is loaded, you should end up with a button here in the shelf, which is pointing to the Golem library. We should also have, if we go into the window uh, menu, we should have a Golem submenu, which will allow you to open the library tool, open the layout editor, export the selection as a terrain, and open an about box. So I'm gonna just expand the about box. So uh, the about box will tell you, you know, everything you want to know regarding uh, which version of Golem you are using and what's the status of your license. So in my case, I'm using 8131, which is what we want to use today. And uh, also it tells me that I'm using the learning edition license, which means that I'll have some uh, missing meshes when I'll uh, populate my characters. But fair enough, I'll fix that um, during the break. Great. Um, so now the plugin is here. So that's great. It's fully available. Uh, and uh, it's probably working properly. Now we also want to check that the Golem character pack are loaded properly. So if we go into the content browser, as we've been installing the Golem characters right at the root of the content directory, we end up with the Golem characters directory here, which we can go into. Um, we can expand and we can see the different characters and we can take any character, for example, uh, like the casual man light, and uh, you know, just open the skeletal mesh. So that's the pink node here. If I double click on it, it will open uh, the character. We'll see, you know, the the assets on it. Yeah, the the normals on the flag are reverted. So this is why uh, we only see the flag in a certain uh, angle there. Uh, so we we see here the character has um, uh, the t-shirt which is blue, the sweatshirt which is red, and uh, they all stacked. Uh, on top of each other, and uh, we'll be able also to, you know, change um, um, the, um, the visibility on each of those mesh uh, to have uh, the, right, the same variation that we had in Tumaya. Um, if we want, we can also take a look at uh, a shader. So, for example, I can take a look at the T-shirt shader, so I can uh, also expand that one. And we can see when we open this, we, we end up with um, a material network which is using a switch and switching between different textures that we would have within Maya. So here that character has been made so you can end up with texture variation. So everything here has been connected and done for you so you don't have to um, you know, do anything uh, if you want to just use the character back. Great, excellent. So now that we have installed everything properly, both the Golem character and the Golem plugin, now it's time to experiment the two different workflows which we have available. So for those two workflow to be used, we'll still need to go in Maya and create some assets. In the first workflow, which is the cache replay workflow, we need to go into Maya and create a simulation and export a simulation cache. And we'll be able to load and replay that simulation cache that's usually used you know, when you want to uh, render sequences within Unreal. So that's the first workflow. And the second workflow will be, we're gonna create a simulation, but rather than exporting a cache, we'll just export what we call the Golem digital asset, and we'll be able to rerun that simulation and interact with it. So let's first, let's first tackle the first workflow, which is replaying a cache. So I go uh, starting Maya here with uh, Golem enabled. So uh, I'll let you uh, launch your favorite version of Maya, which has Golem being installed. And we'll quickly create a new simulation that will export and um, experiment within Unreal. So I'll just wait a couple of more seconds uh, for you to open Maya and uh, make sure that the Golem plugin is loaded. So once again, you can go into settings, preferences, plugin manager, and uh, make sure that uh, the, pl the plugin, which is called GLM Crowd, uh, is actually loaded. And um, once it's done, let's create a simulation. So if you haven't forgot too much about how to use Golem, usually the first thing you want to do is to load an entity type into the scene. So let's load an entity type, we'll grab from the character pack, so from the Maya character pack, we'll grab 
um, whatever characters you'd like to use. So and they're all available except the Toon character. So here in my case, I'm going to use the Casual Man Light character. As always, it's going to ask me if I want to load the shaders. Um, as we're going to render into uh, Unreal here, we don't really care about the shaders, but if we want to see how the characters looks like, it could be convenient to load the shaders uh, into a Maya session. So I'm going to load my uh, shaders for Arnold here. If you don't want to use it for any rendering engine, you can just uh, use the default version of the character. So let's load the Arnold one, which brings the T-Post character. And let's rename that anti-type man uh, car type. We want to probably save that scene as well. Uh, so that's fifth day A, and that's cache replay. Scene. Great. Um, if you want to create the terrain, you know, I'll let you do, um, you know, whatever you'd like to. Uh, here, I really stick with uh, a simple use case, which is uh, a, a blank scene that I will not bother creating a terrain. I grab uh, the population tool so I can populate my scene. Let's uh, push a couple of characters. So I'll just uh, create a grid. Um, let's say I do 100 characters. So the, um, the display within Unreal is not as optimized as we have within Maya. So probably do not put thousands and thousands of characters for the first test. Let's stay to something like hundreds of characters. That, that should be good. Uh, also, you know, Unreal uh, Display is running on GPU. So, you you know, um, if you're putting thousands and thousands of characters, you may require to have, a, you know, a pretty efficient um, device and hardware to run this uh, properly. So I'm going to noise that at some distance between the characters. Um, and uh, when I'm going to be good with this, I'll press the Create button. Pressing the create button will just instantiate my characters in the scene. And um, let's assign them with um, just a couple of motions there. So I'm going to expand the behavior editor, select my entity types. They don't do anything yet. And what I'll just do is assign them with, uh, well, once again, you can do really, really everything you want. If you want to go crazy with the behaviors, go ahead. If you want to grab a scene that we've been working on in the previous uh, sessions, go ahead as well. Uh, here, once again, I'll just stay simple on my side. So I'm just gonna grab a motion behavior. I'm gonna assign a couple of different clips, the different walks, for example. Um, I'm gonna change the start frame. So they're all gonna be different. Um, also like influence slightly the speed ratio. Let's see how that my simulation looks like. Excellent, great. And um, if I want to, you know, bring this with an Unreal and be able to render that simulation with an Unreal, let's save it. I'll have to export that simulation as a simulation cache. So remember, by default, uh, when you're in Golem, you, by default, you're in a simulation mode, which means that anytime you want to see how the simulation looks like, you'll have to run the frames. And uh, you have to evaluate every single frame to see the results of the frame that you want to see. And if you want to export that simulation results, you need to use the simulation exporter. So simulation exporter, once again, it's, wait. Uh, I don't have the tooltips anymore. I see, I do. So yeah, simulation exporter is that one here. It's next to the attributes spreadsheet. You can see one character walking, a cache icon next to M and uh, an orange arrow in between. So we're gonna open that tool. We're gonna say, where do we want to uh, export that cache? So uh, by default, it export into your project, into the cache directory. Um, we're gonna, um, also specify which start frame and frame we want to export, which crowd, we, which simulation we like to export, but we just have one here. And what's the name of the cache, uh, which we'll export there. So let's press export here. And what is going to be done? You can see the timeline has switched. Now it's green. 
You can also see that the golem mode here, uh, the HUD display now tells that we're in cash replay mode. And finally, we can see in the shelf that we've got a walking character which has a cash icon next to M, which means that we are in cash replay. So if at any time we need to go back to simulation, we just have to toggle that button and now we can uh, switch from simulation to cash replay. Great. The cache replay mode is the one we are interested in. So make sure that the, your timeline is green, uh, that your cache mode is, uh, that your mode, uh, golem mode is set up to cache. So the character with the cache icon next to it. And what we'll do is we're going to create something we called a vignette, a library vignette of this simulation. So this simulation here, you know, it references plenty of different files, uh, like, or plenty of different informations. So it references, for example, the start frame, the end frame, the name of the simulation which has, which has been exported, the cache name, the cache directory, the different characters file which have been used. So that's plenty of strings. And obviously we don't want to copy paste all of those individually. So rather than uh, you know having plenty of strings, we want to encapsulate all those data into something we call a vignette. So the good way to handle a vignette is to open the library tool, simulation cache library, so you can find the simulation cache library next to the walking character with the blue uh, magnifier. So if you um, other your mouse on top of that chef icon, it tells simulation cache library, view, create, and edit golem cache vignettes libraries. So let's open that tool. Um, here in my case, I already have a couple of uh, presets into this, but if you want, you can create a new library. So I'm creating a new library, let's say that one here. And uh, into that new library, I can save um, my vignette, so my actual scene simulation. So if I want to save this into my um, new library there, I just have to click on that button here in the shelf, um, in the menu bar. So the last icon in the menu bar, it tells, import from selected scene simulation cache proxy. So if you do this, you'll see that it creates, you know, a, a, um, a screenshot of your simulation and creates a new vignette of it. And we can save that library file as, so let's do a save as, uh, so the, looks like the save button by itself doesn't work. So make sure that you use the save library file as, and um, just ex export it wherever you want to. So here in my case, I'm going to export it into my library directory and I'm going to call it this Academy 2022. Great. So now I have a library file, which is saved in uh, my um, project into my library directory called Academy 22. It has the extension GSCB. So Golem Simulation Cache Library the GSCL was already taken as an extension. So we took the second uh, constant of the name, so which is the B. Um, so we can also take a look at what we have into this. So here it tells us that we've been doing a snapshot, a vignette of a scene called uh, 05A cache replay, which has 150 entities and it is 150 frames. It doesn't have any layout and we can also assign some tags so tags could be, you know, walking man, and afterwards we'll be able to filter if the library is, you know, really big and we want to know exactly what, what doing what, uh, we can provide different tags. If we want, we can also uh, edit the library item uh, attributes. So you can see there's different um, uh, button. You can delete, you can retake a snapshot. So let's say you're not really happy with that snapshot that you're having here. Uh, and, um, you know, you don't want also all those green uh, stuff there into the, your snapshot. You can just um, you know change your view in Maya and redo a snapshot. So it just updates uh, the snapshot for your um, uh, actual item. item. Uh, you can also edit the attribute as I was saying. So you will expand uh, the attribute box and you will see the exact same string attribute than the one I was referring to earlier. So right now it's a, it doesn't have any layout. It's say between frame 150, 101, oh, sorry, one and 150. Uh, and you know all the different naming attributes there. And finally, there's also a button which is called import simulation cache in scene. So if I just save my library, go into and save that scene as well. 
if I go into far new scene, from the library, I can click on any um, vignette and you'll see that it will create a new iteration of your vignette into your uh, current scene. So that's a good way you know, to make vignettes of different motion caches that you have here and there. And at the end, when you want to bring them together, you just have to create a new scene, uh, select the different vignettes you want to bring in and they will be imported and created into new nodes. Uh, Alex, would you mind uh, just uh, logging the fact that the save button doesn't work? Um, so, thank you. Great, so, okay, now we've been exporting the cache, we've been creating a vignette, and now we are ready to go into Unreal. So if I go back into my Unreal session, which has everything in it, you may notice that now uh, into the shelf of Unreal, we've got a button called Golem Library, and now it probably makes more sense. So the Golem Library is the exact same tool than the one that we're having within Maya. So if you, ex if you use that tool here, you will see that it will open the Golem Simulation Cache Library. It has a different template because Maya and Unreal templates are different and we are inheriting from those. And we can open a library file there so we can use the file open button. So the second button from uh, the shelf here, I can jump into my project, which is here, library. And I can open my Academy 22 um, uh, library file. And Exactly the same way that we've been doing this into Maya. I can click on that vignette there. And if everything has been properly installed, if I click on the vignette, it should create for me. Oh, wait. It should create for me the new, a new node. And uh, with the cache, so let's see what we have. Apparently I've got, an error regarding this. So there's the Python error. Let me check if I try another scene. Okay, so it looks like when we fixed uh, uh, Golem 813, we actually broke that part, which is unfortunate. Um, that's too bad. Let me see if I can do this in a different way then. Golem cache. So let me try making this first. And if that works, I'll show you how to reproduce it on your side. Uh, ah, hell. Mm -mm -mm. That's too bad. Okay, never mind. We'll make sure to fix this um, into the next version. Cache directory. So that's going to be there. That was exactly what I wanted to avoid. Uh, you know, copying, pasting, string attributes. But looks like I can't really go through this. Uh, Okay, and uh, probably miss something here. So current frame is going to be, let's say, twenty. Mm, enable simulation. Okay, and for a reason I'm not really aware of. I'm not able to get my uh, loading and cache from library was tested with 8131. Okay, so let me, um, I'm not sure if any of you guys are trying to do this at the same time that I'm doing. Uh, if you are, let me know if you're able to get characters in your scene as soon as you are uh, clicking on, uh, on the library item. Uh, on my side, it's not working, but maybe on yours, it's actually working. So let me know if any of you is trying to do it at the same time. Uh, let me check that I actually installed the right version for the right plugin. Or 
or maybe something I should do is maybe switching to Unreal 5. Because I was testing Unreal 5, I'm pretty sure that was working. So let me check the chat box. Um, okay, and I don't get any feedback. So, okay, let, never mind. Let's try with Unreal 5 instead of 427. Um, probably, what time it is? It's uh, 6.42. I don't even have the cache library popping out. Lots of errors going on my side. Um, but feel free to put the errors into uh, the chat box so we can uh, let you know. Uh, we've been uh, we've been going through uh, various support uh, uh, on various errors. So put it into Q and A, uh, and we can uh, we can take a look at it. So um, maybe probably. It will be a good time to you know make the break now so I can just redo exactly the same step with Unreal 5 uh, because we've been testing that new package with an Unreal 5, but not sure if we've been testing it with 427. And I'm usually I'm usually using 5.0 all the time, so I'm not familiar enough with 427 to figure this out. So um, let me just uh, uh, have that 10 minute break and uh, figure what's uh, the error um, and. Uh, and uh, we'll go back to uh, where we were. Uh, and ALA, the error you're having is because Qt is not installed on your side. So uh, I'm not sure if you were the one saying that that was installed by default with Unreal 5, but um, maybe not. So uh, you'll have to go through the steps that I've been uh, going through earlier, which is installing P side, because here it's saying that it's not finding. Um, that's the final error message you're having. No, Q no Qt binding found. It means that. Um, uh, the dependency that we've been installing P side uh, earlier is not uh, available. So yeah, sorry about that. Um, I wanted to have a you know a brand new machine uh, without my project, and so we go go through uh, uh, the full install process. But uh, obviously here uh, I should have uh, uninstalled and reinstalled it afterwards to make sure that it was working. Uh, so yeah, let's make uh, the ten minute breaks now. Let me figure what's wrong and uh, we'll resume with uh, where we were. Hopefully, uh, I'll figure a way to make it work properly. So, sorry again. And uh, yeah, see you in 10 minutes. So, it's going to be uh, at 54.
Okay. Let me try this time and we're good to go now. Excellent. Okay, I just wait for um, everybody to come back. So yeah, um, sorry about that. That's just uh, something I forgot is that um, amongst the different plugins that we've been enabling, um, you know, I referred to the fact that we need to um, load the Python editor script plugin. And um, also to um, enable the editor scripting utilities. And uh, for both of those plugins, you may notice on the tooltip that it's uh, noticed that you may need to restart the program for this change to take effects. So I actually, uh, you know, enabled uh, those plugins, but I didn't relaunch Unreal. And uh, this is why I couldn't have uh, my uh, library um, and my cache has been created properly. So what I just did is, um, you know, closing Unreal and reopening it. And uh, that was it. So yeah, sorry about that. Uh, that's something, you know, I, I did it once years ago uh, and I didn't remember that I have to uh, relaunch the plugin again. So I knew it was working on my side before, but uh, as I was starting on the blank uh, Unreal uh, session, I totally forgot about this. So if you are, if you're trying to follow this on your side, um, you know, make sure that you're launching Unreal, relaunching Unreal. So, you know, the, the change are taking into effect uh, by the editor. Great. So let me go back to where I was before. So what I was doing is opening the Golem library. I was referring to the fact that if you click on it, it will create for you uh, the exact same cache. So let's take just a minute to figure what we have into our scene. So uh, first is we've seen the character in their uh, original T pose. So the exact same pose than the one that we are having here with the same you know, layering uh, of characters, the same positions, the same orientations and uh, the same shading assignment. Let me just uh, move the lights so my characters are not behind the light. So, okay, that's better. Um, so we end up also with a new node in the scene, which is called a golem cache node. It has an orange icon next to it. And if you select it, you'll see that it has a couple of attributes, such as the exact same attribute that we are storing into the library item uh, tool. So start frame, hand frame, the frame rate, uh, the name of the cache, uh, which is uh, where it's stored, uh, the, where yeah, where the character files are also available. And as we've been installing the Golem character pack, it connected automatically to, so it, it looked at all the projects, looked at all the assets and tried to figure, is there an asset called casual man light into the project? And if it is, it connected automatically the uh, skeletal mesh into the node. And as soon as it does this, if we look below the node, if we expand it, now we can see that we have all the different entities from our scene. And for every single entities, we can see which mesh they are wearing, which material they are uh, being picked. And you can see they all have different textures for the t-shirt, for the hair, for uh, the pants. There are some white pants, some blue pants, uh, then some characters with sweatshirts. There are some characters with t-shirts. And everything is following exactly the same properties that what we have uh, within Maya. So, um, which means that let's say we don't want to have the sweatshirts anymore. Let's say we change our mind. The workflow is exactly the same that what we've been doing before in Maya, which is I can go at any time into 
my character file definition into the geometry tab, we can see that 18% uh, um, of a crowd is wearing the sweatshirt. So if you want to remove this, we can just say, okay, I don't want to wear the sweatshirt anymore. We can just save this. And if we go into Unreal and just ask for a refresh cache, now you can see that the characters which were wearing the sweatshirt, they are not wearing the sweatshirt anymore and it's you know um, updated interactively. So that's the really great thing about having a plugin which allows to bring the geometry within Unreal is that nothing is baked. We never have to export any LM baked, any FBX. So everything is still interactive. So if you change your mind about anything, you can still change it uh, and have it reflected within Unreal. So that's the really great thing about it. So also second thing that we want to check if is does the cache replace properly? So I can go into make sure that I'm in... Uh, uh, current camera location and just press play. And as soon as I do that, now I can replay my cache. So my cache is 150 frames. So you will just run until we reach, um, you know, no more frames. And when we reach uh, 150 frames, the character just disappear because there's, there aren't uh, not any more data to this. So usually the, you know, the workflow you're having with uh, having such stuff here is to, oops, uh, is to control and sequence your cache is the, the way you want to. So define exactly what you want, uh, how you want your cache to be replayed. So um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but let me show you. You can use something which, which is called uh, the sequencer. So the sequencer allows you to define when does an asset plays and when it doesn't. So it allows to sequence different caches together if you want to. So I'm gonna create a level sequence uh, which I can rename um, cache replay. Within that uh, sequencer, I can you know select my various objects, put them into a, a linear timeline, and I can just uh, now sequence uh, my different nodes. So what I can do is add uh, a new actor to the sequencer. So an actor is a unit into the sequencer. So I can select my golem cache. Within the golem cache, I can specify which uh, specific uh, informations I would like to sequence. So you can sequence multiple stuff. You can transform, like you can kind of keyframe the overall transformation of your cache. Or what we can also um, ask to sequence is the actual cache files. So we can see here that, uh, so I added the crowd cache to my golem cache node. So we have the 150 frames of the cache. And now when we're going to move the time, we're able to see exactly what's going on. If we want, we can take this, you know, and, and retime this and say, okay, until frame 25, uh, 20, uh, 44 into Unreal, nothing is happening. And as soon as the cache reach a specific frame, now I can see the actual data. Great. So final stuff I would like to show you um, while um, using uh, the cache replay workflow is that you can still um, lay out your crowd. So this is what something will do. So let me go back to uh, my initial sequence. I'm gonna save that current level. And um, first what I'll do is um, just go back into Maya, for example, and uh, reopen my scene with the shaders. Great. And let's say I would like to, I don't know, copy a bunch of characters and put them and put them somewhere and going into an opposite direction. So remember that's something we've been seeing into uh, the last uh, session, um, the last uh, regular session, which is the usage of the layout tool. So I can grab a bunch of character. Uh, I can, uh, and so to make sure that uh, I can grab characters, I press the F9 key. So F9 key is component mode. Um, then I can just ask to open the translation uh, tool. I can grab the translation tool and move my characters um, in a different location if I want. Or uh, I can use the orientation tool as well and say, I want to rotate my characters around the object pivot. So now they are rotating around their own pivots. So I've got the same patch, but which is moving differently. And everything here is recorded as a new transformations into my cache. So I can even say that I would like to duplicate those characters. So I have twice more character in the scene and um, that patch here of translated characters and I can copy it elsewhere 
and um, you know manipulate my cache. And here, so that means that we have been adding more characters, we've been changing uh, various stuff, and we want obviously this to replicate within Unreal as well. So what I'll do is first, I'm gonna save all my operations. So I'm gonna save everything as a layout file. So let's put that layout file into the same directory of the cache. Let's call it, for example, layout. And um, if we pay attention to the node, which is holding all the data, we can see that it has all the previous data that we, we've been recorded into um, the uh, library, but it also have a new information now, which is the layout file. So if I refer to what I have into the library at the moment, we can see that we don't have any layout. We just have the 150 entities for 150 frames, but we will have to update that library item with the layout. So while well, we don't have any specific bu button to uh, actually update the the vignette so what we should do is just creating a new vignette into our scene so if i press on the button again uh, you can see it's creating a new um, a new vignette and once again i can if i want recreate a snapshot and we can see that contrary to the previous one we've got a layout name here and the layout name is the file that we've been um, exporting and which is available so i can just remove that one here save that library. And if I go into Unreal now, I can delete the Golem cache node, open the Golem cache library and bring my new library vignettes into the scene. And now I end up with within my two groups of characters going into a separate direction. So what was the purpose of all of this? Uh, the purpose is that within Unreal, you also have access if you'd like to to the layout tool. So if you go into, um, that's not a, a button which is available from the shelf. So you have to go into the window uh, menus into the Golem sub menu and you got the Golem layout editor. If you want uh, from the Golem cache node, there's also a button here into the section called simulation layout, which is open layout file. And open layout file will also open the layout tool in context. So already loaded into uh, the system. And here we end up with the exact same modifications than the one we've been doing. So we have the translation that we've been applying on the duplicated characters, the rotation that we've been applying, so on and so forth. And at any moment, you know, we can expand this if we want to. We can uh, kill some characters, uh, remove some characters, do whatever we want to, or we can just um, you know, disable all the modifications that we've been doing. For example, I can just go back into the first node here, press V. V is just... Um, um, to tell this is the node which will be uh, evaluated. And you can see that within the viewport now, you don't have the characters anymore. If you press V on uh, the translate at the end of your uh, uh, workflow, now you can see that your viewport gets uh, updated as well. So most of the layout tool, well, actually all the layout tool, you can pre-visualize them in the cache replay and most of them, you can even create them into Unreal. I'm saying most of them uh, because, you know, when we were in Maya, we were playing, for example, with the iKey rig layout node, which was, uh, which was enabling us to bring an iKey rig in the scene and reanimate uh, with keyframes locally a character. So that's something which is not available within Unreal at the moment. But all the other nodes, most of the other nodes, you know, the remove, uh, the translate, the rotate, the scale, duplicate, that kind of nodes, they are available and you can actually um, edit and um, refine your cache replay within Unreal. Yeah, time offset is already available. Uh, it's also available. Um, I can you know, um, bring a frame offset here, for example, and uh, just apply a 10 frame offset. And you can see that the characters in the background, they are refreshing themselves if I provide a different offset there. So yeah, frame offset is also available within Unreal. That's mostly, you know, the edit trajectory, um, the, IQ, the posture and the IQ rig uh, nodes, which are not available because they require to have, you know, external locators like the curves and like the rigs uh, to be able to control the actual posture. And that's something we, we haven't implemented within Unreal yet. And uh, if it's of interest of uh, any of you guys, let us know and uh, you know, if we know that some people are interested into this, uh, it's always 
uh, bringing more motivation and more uh, uh, pressure onto a feature. When we're happy with this, um, you know, as always, just press um, save. And, uh, you know, if we go back into Maya, we also having uh, the same, uh, we can refresh the cache and we can have the exact same uh, operation being applied. So now we've got the 10 frame offset being applied on those characters as well. And if I open the layout tool here, I also end up with the frame offset that's have been uh, created into Unreal. So yeah, hope that makes sense. That was the cache replay workflow. Once again, that's mostly used to, you know, um, render your crowds within Unreal uh, by using uh, all the casual uh, and nice uh, real-time rendering features there. So hope that makes sense. And uh, if it does, then we'll switch into the second workflow, which is replaying a simulation. So probably we've got a pull. Yeah, exactly. Um, does uh, I know that's uh, less people being connected today because uh, uh, it's a, a bonus session and not everybody's interested into Unreal. But let us know if you were able to, you know, uh, try to follow and if you're able to follow it is properly. If you, as always, you know, it's it's recorded and uh, that will be online uh, from tomorrow, so you'll still be able to go back into this. Now you know that you have to restart Unreal for this to work properly. And in the meantime. What I'll do is start a brand new scene. Um, or do I want to start a brand? Yeah, I do want to start a brand new scene. Save it here and also with it in real. Let's close the layout tool. Well, the good news is everybody who tried uh, loading the plugin, uh, well, who tried to load the Golem cache succeeded. So that's I take this for granted. Okay, so yeah, let's move to the second workflow. I'm gonna close the simulation library. I'm gonna save that map here and I'm creating a new level, which will be a default level and put it, okay, this to zero, zero, zero. There, okay, great. So, uh, in the previous workflow that we've been um, seeing here, obviously we couldn't interact with the crowd anymore, uh, which means that if you are in a real-time project, maybe a previous project or maybe a video game project, and you have some a character, an actor, which is controlled by something external from the simulation, the character will not react to that actual character. So if you want them to avoid, if you want them to collide, with something which is belonging to Unreal, that's not something which was available with the cache replay workflow, right? So the second workflow we're gonna introduce is the simulation workflow, which means that we can design a simulation in Maya and we can bring it into Unreal and use Unreal to trigger some behavior or uh, to bring some external entities to be avoided by the other characters or to create some colliders, which will be taken into account by the physics collisions and so on and so forth. So we just have, uh, well, we don't have a lot of time to tackle this. So I'll mostly show you what's the workflow here. And uh, once again, we've got plenty of tutorials that you can go through if you want to dive uh, deeper into this. But I'll show you how you bring a simulation and how you can use the blueprints to interact with it. Great. So let's go. Uh, as always, we still need to create a simulation template from Maya. And uh, we'll be able to influence that simulation template afterwards within Unreal, expose some attributes and have them being overridden within Unreal. So as always, let's create a new entity type. Um, so I'm gonna create, uh, I'm gonna use the one, the same casual character. I was happy with that guy here. Um, by accident, I created a sensor, so let me remove it. Let's save that scene 05B scene replay, great. And um, maybe what we can do here is um, we're going to make a navigation go to scene and um, specify a target. And what I would like to do is uh, go within Unreal and change the target. Uh, I would like to you know, use an Unreal object to be the target and maybe keyframe that object afterwards uh, or have it being controlled by any, um, any uh, character control so the character can follow that object. So uh, let's populate my scene. So let's uh, put a bunch of characters there, change the distance. As always, well, I let you do whatever you want to. Uh, 
don't put thousands and thousands of entities. Let's stick with hundreds. That should be fine. Uh, let's noise that slightly. And let's create. So now my characters, they are, are going to be T-posed. And what I want to do is assign them with some behaviors such as uh, uh, a go-to behavior. Uh, and by default, I would like them to go to a target. So let's create a target. My target is going to be, uh, let's put it in a specific location like 50. 50 so it's going to be there. Well, probably 2020 should, 1010 10 should be good. 10, 0, 10. There. Okay. So go to, and I want them to reach a target pop tool and the target pop tool is going to be that one there. Great. I want to assign them with a uh, navigation here. And um, finally, I obviously want them to be animated. So I'm going to bring a locomotion behavior. And as always, I'm going to bring up some motions from the locomotion pack, load them all. And every time I have, I go, I go, Pretty quickly through this, I'm going to consider that we've been, you know, doing this plenty of times now and that you guys are kind of familiar with that workflow now. So I'm going to just go through that pretty quickly. Excellent. And when we throw the sim, I've got all my characters um, all gathering to that target there. And uh, here my timeline is limited to 150 frames. But obviously, it's a simulation. So within Unreal, as long as we are going to play the simulation, we'll have the characters gathering to the target and will not be limited by the same timeline than the one that we are having. So let's save that scene. And if I want to bring this within Unreal as a simulation template, I will have to use another button in the shelf. So, you know, remember before uh, in the previous workflow, we were using the simulation exporter. So simulation exporter allows to bake a uh, simulation cache. And next to it, you may notice that there's something called the engine exporter, which is exporting a Golem simulation as a Golem digital assets. So Golem digital assets uh, extension file is GDA. And um, yeah, GDA is just digital asset. And if you're familiar with, you know, the Houdini engine and Houdini digital asset, the ID is kind of inspired uh, by, by this. So the engine exporter means that we're going to export all the simulation information, such as the different behaviors we've been assigning for each behavior, the different, the various attributes we've been assigning and uh, the various entity types which are existing into the scene, the initial positions, of uh, the population tool. And obviously also the initial position of the target. So everything will get recorded into the digital asset, which means that we'll be able to recreate that exact same simulation into a different context. And um, uh, that context will be able to run the simulation the exact same way than within Maya. So we can get the exact same result. So let's, um, open that tool here, the engine exporter. So let's click on it. And what it just asks is to specify where we'd like to export the Golem digital asset. So I'm not going to export it within the same directory than my cache. I'll just go uh, one uh, level above, uh, create probably a new directory called engine, and I'll save it into this. Uh, once it's exported, you will tell, um, you will have an um, uh, info message here into the, the script editor uh, feedback, which tells you that uh, it has successfully exported uh, the GDA file into blah, 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 uh, 05B uh, scheme replay GDA. So what I'll do is I'll just open the script editor and probably copy paste that pass because I'll require it. So let's go within Unreal now. And if we want to be able to open that GDA there, what we need to bring into the scene is not the same node that what we had before. So before we had creating a cache replay node, which was using the Golem library. 
So if I go into um, you know the create menu of Unreal, the place actors menu in Unreal, I can uh, start typing Golem. And um, here I just type a GOL and you can see you've got plenty of different uh, nodes available. So we've got the Golem cache and all the orange nodes which are related to the cache replay nodes. And we've got a Golem simulation node, which is blue. And that Golem simulation node is the node that we're gonna use to replay the GDA. So what I'll just do is I just grab the node, head it into the scene. So now we've got a new node into the scene called Colem Simulation. Let's um, uh, replace um, its uh, initial position to zero, zero, zero. So the simulation will be uh, starting from the same offset. And um, you can see it as into the common panel, uh, the GDA file attributes, and we can browse to find where is the GDA file that we would like to apply. So I'll just jump into the directory in which I exported my GDA file, open it, and now I end up with a grid of characters. And once again, that's the exact same grid than the one I'm having when the characters get initialized. So the 60 something characters with a geometry variation and everything that we had before. So let me just, once again, change the light source. Uh, let me stop for a while. Um, um, there was a, a couple of uh, stuff I wanted to um, provide feedback about. Uh, one is there should be an orange ball in the locomotion menu to change the behavior of all imported assets. Um, so actually I thought about it not so long ago. Um, but the thing is, not sure if you uh, figured, but uh, I didn't mirror all the animation because like the walked animation or the stand animation, there's no, uh, there's no specific interest to mirroring them. The linear and the angular velocity will be the same, but I figured probably we can detect automatically the turns and uh, we can enable mirroring on the turns only. So that's something I wanted to take into it. Uh, I wanted to look and uh, put it into then one of the next release. Uh, but yeah, uh, uh, I was on, on the holidays recently, so I haven't had the time, but uh, actually a pretty good idea. Um, if possible, it will be cool to show with terrain adaptation workflow with this too. Uh, yeah, if I got a chance, uh, I'll also show you uh, how we can, uh, you know, uh, replace uh, the ground adaptation mesh on which we'll adapt. Um, we'll see else that's there. I'm pretty sure there's a tutorial which is dedicated to that part. Uh, and if it's not, uh, I'll probably shoot one. But uh, we'll see if we uh, I got a, the chance, but I'll show you how you can override a mesh uh, into the simulation. So you'll have a, you'll have a pretty good idea of uh, what uh, should happen uh, if you had to override the terrain. So, okay, um, let's take a look at what we have here. If I play the simulation now, all my character gathers to a an invisible an invisible point, which is at 15, 15. Uh, well, 15, zero, 15. So the target here is not in the scene. So we can't really see it, but the characters, they are gathering at the same uh, exact position. So how do I know that it's an actual simulation running and not a cache replay is that, well, here I've been running the simulation for a really long time and it's still running and I didn't export it any file. So here the simulation is actually, you know, run interactively. But it's not really interesting, you know. Um, what we may want to do is probably change the target position, maybe change uh, the amount of characters at the beginning. Here, I just have 60 characters, but what if I want to have 200, and without having to go back into uh, Maya and change my simulation? So, how can I interact with that simulation and change its attributes? So, let's take a look. We've got our Golem simulation node. There, it references plenty of uh, different entities. So they are the same that what we had before. Uh, they determine, you know, what are going to be the assets going to be assigned for each uh, single entities there. And into the Golem simulation um, node, we've got the GDA file, and we can see that we've got something called the GDA properties. And at the moment, uh, we don't have any uh, elements in it. So let's go back to where we were. And let's see what are the GDA properties and uh, what we can, how we can use them to interact with the simulation. So a GDA property is anything which is saved into the digital assets. Once again, if you're familiar with Houdini and the Houdini digital, uh, digital assets, you create your simulation within the main uh, Houdini editor. 
And what you can do is, you know, create a really hundreds of nodes with thousands of parameters. And obviously you don't want to expose all of them. You want to carefully pick which one are going to be exposed to your user. So the user can fine tune the entire graph by just changing parameters, which are actually easy to handle and easy to understand. So the GDA properties, they are exactly the same. Every single attribute that we have here can be exposed to the user and the user can use it to you know, change the actual behavior of your simulation. So how do we expose attributes? So we have to go into the crowd manager. So that's the main node being used for um, you know, handling everything which is shared by the whole simulation. And uh, amongst the various stuff, um, uh, among the various panels which are available, you can see there's a Golem engine attributes panel here, which is uh, closed. We can expand it and we can see we've got something called GDA public attribute and GDA aliases. Uh, and it's empty. It's apparently two string uh, attributes. And what we can do is actually expand the tools next to it. And um, by using the helper, and as soon as you click on any of those buttons, you can see that it opens the GDA attribute panel. So the GDA attribute panel provides you the list of all the nodes being available in the scene with all the attributes being available in all the nodes. For each attribute, it tells you what it is, uh, the type of attribute it is. It tells you if it's exposed or not exposed. And you can see you've got check boxes here that you can uh, enable to define if you want to expose them. And as some attribute names can be pretty cryptic, you can also provide an alias, which will you know, be uh, more verbose, uh, more relevant for the user, which will have to change this. So for example, I wanted to change my target here. My target is 15, 0, 15, and maybe I want to have it elsewhere. So if I look for target there, uh, if I search target, I can see I end up with the go-to behavior. So the go-to behavior is the actual behavior we are using to target an actual position for the characters. And we've got something called in target position, which is an array of vector free. So it's um, multiple three positions. So what I want to do is expose it. So I'm gonna um, uh, enable um, public attributes there. And uh, do I want to provide an alias? I can provide maybe target position, target post alias. Great. Uh, maybe I also want to change the speed of my characters. Uh, here they're all walking, but maybe I want them to run at some point. So let's check for speed. Uh, speed, if I uh, type speed here, I can uh, see I've got the navigation behavior, which is the one handling the speed. And I can change the minimum speed and the maximum speed. Those are float attributes. So I can once again expose the two of them. Uh, I also mentioned that I would like to change probably uh, the initial position of my character. Right now they have uh, 60 characters, but I would like maybe to have less, more. So uh, uh, how do I change this? So I can look for maybe the population tool. So here I just uh, type pop. I can get my population tool here, which is the tool uh, creating the grid there. And um, I've got uh, a position attribute an orientation attribute and those two are vector-free arrays. So I just want to expose the vector-free there. So when I'm done with all of those, I've you know I exposed a couple of stuff. So let's call it pop positions. I can press apply. And um, now you'll see that um, uh, it will populate those different attributes there, those string attributes there, and they will be used when we're gonna export the GDA. They're gonna be used to um, know exactly what we should expose and make public um, into Unreal. And at any time, you know, you can still go back into this and uh, uncheck or recheck uh, anything that you're not um, happy with or something you would like to add into. Great. So as we changed, you know, the attributes being available, we need to re-export that GDA. So I'm going to just reopen it, save it, and it will be re-exported with the same uh, pass with the same name. And if I go with an Unreal now, and I just asked to refresh the GDA file. Now I can see that I've got four GDA properties being available on my node. If I expand this, I'll get the various uh, attributes that I have exposed. If I provide an alias name, you'll have the right, the nice name next to it. So here, pop positions and target posts. And if you didn't, you just get the long name with the actual behavior in it.
So we've got a GDA vector property here, a GDA float property, float property, and vector free property. So those are the, the various types of attribute that we can expose. So let's start simple um, and, um, and just uh, change the speed of the characters. Maybe I would like to, I, I don't want to change it like um, uh, in a dynamic manner. I just want to change it when the simulation starts. I want to have a variation of that simulation. I want my characters to run from the exact same simulation file. What I can just do is uh, expand uh, the navigation speed min. So whenever I expand a new attribute, it opens a new tab into the um, Unreal Property Editor. So I've got the speed min and speed max attributes there. I can see um, various information such as what's the short name of it, what's the long name. So those are you know unique names that we will be able to use into the blueprints a bit later um, to actually uh, change it if we want to. Um, we can see the dimension. So if it was supposed to be an array, we will see how many elements it has. Um, do we need to override it? And if we need to override it, what type of attribute it is? So it's a speed attribute. So if, if I want to override it, I can expand uh, the value here. And the value is uh, going to be there. So uh, it has been converted into the uh, Unreal unit. So we've got um, speed minimum is uh, 100. So 100 is probably uh, one meters per second, which is what we have into um, uh, Maya. And this is the maximum speed here. And once again, we can expand it and see uh, the default value, which is 140, which is uh, 1.4 meters per second there. So let's say I want my characters to run. I just have to change those values. So here I'm going to specify probably 200. So 200 is two meters per second. And maximum speed is going to be 220, for example. And just by changing, overriding those attribute and changing those attribute, the next time I'm going to run the simulation, now I get all my characters which are running. So they are actually reacting to the public attributes which are actually exposed. Great. So what else I can do? I can go into the target position as well. I can probably open that one. And I can ask to override it. So we can see that that one has an array size of uh, one element. So we can see um, it's an actual array. Here, we just provided one position, but we can provide as many positions as we want to. So let's say we want to override this. We can check what are the different values. So the values is um, where they are, they've been converted into the Unreal um, axis coordinates here. So uh, as it's a Z up, we can see the target is on the floor and uh, it's on the uh, y, x uh, direction. So let's say we don't want our characters to go into that position anymore. I can provide maybe a minus sign here, override the value. And once again, I can probably save those here as um, same map there. And if I just play the same, I've got all the characters now running into the opposite direction there. Okay, so that, that's kind of, useful we can change locally so that means we can make plenty of variations there but what if we want to actually really interact with something which is you know going on into unreal uh maybe we'd like to have like a, a geometry mesh and we want that geometry mesh the vertices of that geometry mesh you know to control the target position or maybe we have a geometry mesh and we want that geometry mesh to control the actual initial positions of my characters uh or maybe you want to follow an actual um the character position, you want all the characters to gather at the character's position and have something which is dynamic. So to do this, we'll have to use Blueprints. So Blueprints is the way to visually program behaviors into Unreal. Um, so if you're not familiar with Blueprints, they could be you know, pretty complex. You can drop you know, dozens and dozens of nodes to create uh, your behavior. And that's something you can take advantage of to also control those GDA properties that we've been showing here. So Let's say here, I would like to um, be able to have a geometry to drive my initial position for the characters. So I'll start with something simple. What I'll just do is uh, I just create a uh, geometry into my Maya scene here uh, because um, well, I'm not really good with Unreal, but it seems to me that I'm not really able to do modeling with an Unreal except for a few couple of objects. So I'm more familiar with Maya here. So I'll just uh, you know, create a desk. And what I would like to do is, um, you know, have a character on every single of those vertices. I don't really care how many characters I had into my initial scene. 
What I just want to have is one character per vertex and I want to use this to populate my actual scene. So that what I'll just do is create that geo and uh, I'm going to export it as, um, uh, as an FBX file. So I'm going to export selection. Uh, let's export it into a convenient place. So here it's going to be fine. And uh, this is going to be my disk population there. Uh, I don't want it to be animated, uh, this population. So just export the selection. And um, with an Unreal now, I can go into my content browser and just ask to import a new asset into here. That should be fine. So I'm just uh, you know importing a geometry there. I'm just going to grab my FBX which is supposed to be here. Uh, probably you will have to rescale it afterwards. We'll see. Let's bring that disc into the scene. Yeah, it's, I knew I had to rescale it at some point. Maybe I should rescale it from the direct imports. Do you want to write it? Yes. Oh, damn. There's no way to... No, it's still small. Okay, I just wanted to have the scale panel again. Let me see if I try again. Import to game. This oh, here it is. Uniform scale, 100. Import all. Great. And now my disk, okay, is more convenient. So, okay, that's... um. That's my disk here, which has some vertices. I would like to use those vertices to populate, uh, to create my initial population. So what I can do is go into the blueprints and uh, open the level blueprints. So the level blueprints, so that's the way, this is where you can design, you know, everything which will be interacting with your, uh, with your actual Unreal scene, which can be related to Golem or which can be really different from, you know, what we're doing there. So um, what I'll do is uh, first uh, create a um, pointer to the Golem simulation. So I can go into my Golem simulation here, drag and drop it into the blueprint. And that creates for me, you know, a kind of a link to that Golem simulation node. I also want to use that disk population uh, and, um, you know, use it to fit it some attributes. So I'm going to also grab it here. So that's creating a disk population there and from here i'm gonna start making some notes so it's been a while since i've been using the blueprint level so uh, hopefully i'll figure my uh, shortcuts back but from the golem simulation the first thing i want to do is extract the actual parameters that i want to override so um, make sure that you drag a, a link from your golem simulation using the left click make sure that once the window appears you stick to context sensitive uh, option. So it will only show you the nodes which are re relevant to the actual node that you are using right now. And if you type, uh, if you start typing GDA, uh, you'll have plenty of options which will be available from um, um, your Golem simulation node. So the first thing we would like to do is to find an, the actual GDA properties that we have. So on our Golem simulation node, there are four properties being exposed at the moment. There's the navigation speed mean, max, there are the position for the pop tool, and there are the position for the targets. So we want to first specify which one would like to read and take into account. So we've got find GDA properties by full name or by short name. So remember when we were opening a property, we can see two various name, one which was really long, the full context property, one which was really short. Here, I want to use the short one. So I'll just uh, create one. So it creates a new node called find GDA properties by short name. You can see it has those uh, white arrows, which define when does that um, uh, comment will happen. And it has a target. So the target comes from the Golem simulation. You can have multiple Golem simulation in your scene. And finally, it has a short name. So what we can do is just go into our Golem simulation node, go into the pop positions, and we want to take into account the short name of the GDA, and that's the actual alias. So let's grab pop positions there. Oops, I shouldn't have to close it because it's here. And paste it here. So now what I'm taking into account is the population tool positions of my 
uh, golem simulation. Then the thing is um, that population, that property here, you know, it's a kind of a compound attribute. It has plenty of various information in it. It has uh, the, well, the, the short name, the full name, the different dimensions, the override. And by the way, we want to override the value. So let's enable override. So what we want to actually being able to extract is the actual value of it. So when we expand the value, we can see the 60 different positions of my crowd. So for each of the agents, this is the actual position at which they are created. So we want to override that specific component, uh, component of that uh, GDA property. So we want to create another node right after, make sure context sensitive is still checked. And we want to go into GDA. And we can see that now we can cast this property as various different types. Uh, and we can see there's one which is called, um, well, there's various properties. There's float properties, int32, uh, um, int34. Int so for each of those, you can actually check for, sorry, for each of those properties, you can see what they are exactly. So they are vector-free elements. Uh, and let me make sure that I'm actually doing the right stuff because I know that for the pop tool, there's something slightly different. Wait a minute. I think I went too far. Let me just remove this. Ah. Wait, wait, wait. I just want to remove that connection so I can check something else. Wait. Okay. Uh, GDA. Ah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I knew that I was going the wrong way, kind of. Um, you know, so, okay, what I was doing was uh, kind of um, valid. Uh, you know, I could have like converted into a uh, GDA vector free property and then, you know, override every single property from the array. But that would take me uh, some time. And also, I would have to drop probably 10, 12 nodes to be able to grab the actual positions. So as we figured, that's probably something which is um, like overriding the population to a position. As we figured, that's something that people would like to do on a pretty often. We can probably encapsulate all those 10 nodes into a specific node. So sorry about that. I should have tried this from the beginning. Uh, rather than um, finding something by property name, we actually have something called override pop tool from mesh. And okay, here we go. So let me remove this. And that's you know doing all the operations for you. So let's take a look at what we have here. Um, so override pop tool from mesh, it takes a target. So target still is the simulation. So this hasn't changed. Then it has a population tool name. So that's going to be uh, our job to uh, figure what's the population tool name, which is exposed. So here that's pop tool shape one. So let's grab the population tool because we can have multiple population tool being available from the scene. And finally, it has a mesh that we want to um, assign. So here I can take my disk population mesh, assign it to my characters. And the final thing I need to do is specify when does that uh, node will be executed, will be happening. So within Unreal, you can specify um, you know, exactly when a specific graph should happen. And um, those are called events. So the events, um, you can see there are multiple in the scene. There's one event, which is when it, we begin to play. So when the simulation starts, we'll assign, we create this uh, assignment or anytime a new, the simulation is updated and you can have multiple events. The event can be, I press on the key. And uh, when I press on the key, I want my characters to um, do something specific. So uh, that's the two default events that we're having. But what we can do is just say, okay, we want this to happen when the simulation gets started. And if you want to actually see the result of this, you first need to compile, make sure that everything is correct. So compiling allows you to validate the graph. So it will execute, pre-execute the graph, figure if all the connections have been made for you. If you only connected stuff which are valid with each other. And if you want to see the actual result of this, you can just press play. And that's a fail. Wait, uh, what have I missed? Uh, target mesh. It looks like pop tool shape one. Should I maybe should I put the name of the attribute? Let me try this. Pretty sure that's the name of the position tool I should put into this. Huh. Wait, wait, wait. 
There's still, or maybe, wait, that's because I've been overriding this. And I'm pretty sure that was the right name. Okay. Okay. Wait. Now that's stop. Override. And check. Put back the name of the population tool. Save it here. Compile. Okay, I'm like I'm unlucky today. Um, so let's check. Uh, where's the logger here? So if I just to write this. I just want to make sure that this is working. The override is working properly. So I changed one value there. Okay, so this one is working properly. I can see the characters moving when I change the values. Huh. So that should happen when the submission gets start. So that's the one I'm looking for. My target is this one here. The name of my pop tool is correct. My actual mesh is supposed to be correct too. Okay, I'm not sure what's happening, but that should be silly. And I'm not really sure. Yeah, maybe I have to use the short name. So let me try using the short name, see if I can get something better out of it. Uh, but I was doing this earlier today and I didn't have any issues. Oh, well, let's, do I have to, exp I can't remember if I actually exposed those attributes or not really. Yeah, let me check. Okay, let's try putting the full name there first. Okay, that doesn't change. Let me try using the short name there. Okay, that doesn't help. And let's try, last thing I want to try is maybe remove the alias because that's something I haven't been using earlier. Oops, so positions. Apply. Save it here. Say it there, refresh it here. So the pop tool is there. Okay. And let me try putting the pop tool name there. Let's close this, reopen it. Okay, pop tool position. So here we've got correct names. Um, wait. Persistent level, okay. Okay, still no. Okay, not really sure what's happening, but that's supposed to work this way. And that was working earlier today when I, I made the tests. And there's one guy who's going into a different direction here. Okay, he decided that uh, he didn't want to follow uh, the rest of the, the group. Not sure where he's going actually. Uh, yeah, that was that was supposed to work. Um, I'll figure. Uh, I have to figure this uh, after, and uh, and uh, probably we we attach a solution to the to the replay video. Uh, but that was working like earlier today, so uh, that's a shame that I'm not able to have it to work anymore now. Um, anyway, but you get the idea. Um, for so for this situation here, overriding the pop tool from a mesh, we got that node which encapsulate everything. And also I wanted to show you um, how you can override any other attributes that we have. So for now we've been changing, let's say, you know, the speed of the characters uh, just uh, manually here, but let's say you would like to use another attribute which is related to something else into your scene. 
Um, I also wanted to show you how that's something you can do uh, as well with the blueprints. So, okay, let's uh, tackle this. Um, I'll just let that know, and uh, probably if I figure that or later, we'll just record an extra um, an extra shot to that session uh, to make it work properly. So, okay, um, what I'll just have to do is um, do exactly what I was doing before, before I just uh, change my mind and use the override pop tool from Mesh, which is first um, searching for a specific GDA property. So um, the property would like to uh, change here will be, um, let's say the, um, the minimum or the maximum, whatever. Um, we're gonna do this uh, the exact same way. So that's something we've been doing before. So um, we need to provide the short name. I'm gonna just uh, grab the short name of it. So let's provide the na um, navigation maximum speed there. And go back here. Let's provide the short name there. We also want to connect it to when the simulation starts. So um, actually, if we you know drag another uh, link from the begin play, you can see it uh, get removed from what we have before. That's because um, we the Unreal only well events only allow one external connection. So what if we want something to happen and something else to happen? There's actually a node dedicated to this, which is called a sequence. So if I go, that's a, an Unreal node. So if I type sequence there, here. So I can first say, I want to do this first, and I want to do this afterwards just by using that sequence. So first you will override the pop tool from Mesh. So here it's not working, but once again, I just have to figure what's wrong. And then it will just uh, fetch the navigation speed max. Um, and uh, and um, that will just uh, put one action after each other. Great. So as I was saying earlier also, this is a compound attribute. So we want to be able to cast this. So I go into GDA. We know that this is a float property. So we want to cast this as a um, um, GDA float property. Here we end up with an actual float value and that float value we can use um, node called set value here to actually set the value of the maximum speed that we're having right now so as we've been doing before we can probably put here a float attribute and connect it here and that will change the value but something which may be you know more interesting to use is probably something coming from the simulation so um, something that I like to do is maybe use um, an object and uh, use the size of that object to control uh, the value of my speed. So to do this, I can just probably create um, just a box. Let me just tap, oops, up. So let's create a box, like a cube, put it into the scene. And let's say we want to use the scale of that cube that scale property here to drive the actual navigation speed max value that we have there. So the first thing we need to do is bring the cube into the scene. And we'll have to, let me just sort my stuff. There, 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 here we go. Okay. And we want to um, be able to read the actor, let me just, uh, I've got some notes here that I'm not really always using this all the time. So which node I need to use? Okay, I've got an actor scale node, which makes sense. So get actor scale 3D. So that returns a vector free uh, value here, which is a XYZ value. Uh, I can probably break this value here to have the XYZ various value here. So what we're doing is saying, okay, we're taking the cube. From the cube, we are extracting the scale. From the scale, we're breaking the different values as X, Y, Z. And we're gonna take those X, Y, Z value to um, write those uh, for the navigation speed max. So I'm just gonna specify, use the X um, component of my scale, put it into my set node. And now what we should have is compile this. Let me make sure that I connected everything together. I need to connect the set so it knows exactly when it should happen. Let's compile. So that should be good. And let's provide 
a scale here, scale X, um, huge value, but a thing is actually low value there. And let's provide a minimum, override the minimum value there as well, which is there. And we can actually do the same thing for the minimum value connected to something else, for example. And let me check. Speed there. Oh, wait a minute. That's supposed to be 220 there. So that's, uh, yeah, the unit is different. It's not one anymore. So we need to provide a, uh, a, bigger, uh, a bigger value there. So that's the mean here. So let's provide 100. And here, let's provide, let's let it there. And oops. And just change the cube scale to 100. And if everything goes well, I should get my characters not running anymore. But up. but walking instead of uh, instead of running because I've been changing. Nico, we uh, we don't see your screen. I don't know why, but oh wait, ah, you mean the screencast is dead? Yep. Ah, wait. I think the yeah I think the graphic driver may maybe uh, zoom crashed <laughs> for some on. reason. Wait a minute. Um. Which one is that supposed to be share? Okay. Yeah, Are we back? back? Great. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, now uh, we've got the characters walking uh, instead of running uh, because they've been changed uh, because the scale of the cube now tells them that the maximum speed they can go is one meters per second. Uh, and what we had before was 220. Uh, so now we only have uh, walking characters going to the target. Um, and obviously the target can be changed. The scale of the character can be changed. You can even change the... Um, RNG, so which is the uh, random seed of the simulation to get a complete simulation. You can change the repartition of the crowd, the motion clips that you want to use. So every single attribute, which, can, which is a string, vector free, vector free array, float, integer, whatever, um, can be changed using blueprints or just overriding attributes within the properties. Once again, sorry for the pop tool uh, mesh stuff. That's uh, something which was working when I tried it this afternoon. So I'll have to figure exactly. Did I'm you sorry? see your message? It was it was talking about the orientations, so maybe you forgot to make it public and. Uh... Ah damn! Yeah, that's it. And this is what I've been. Yeah, true. Yeah, true. Ah, wait a minute. Let's fix this, so we can end up with a good note. Pop. Yeah, true. Um. Indeed, for this to work, I could totally forgot about it, but uh, indeed position and orientation should be exposed. And I'm pretty sure that's gonna be the issue here. So let's re-export this. Let's go into Unreal. Let's check that what I put into my, it hits the right stuff and let's refresh the GDA. So I should have five elements now. Okay, great. Okay, sorry about that. Um, actually, we are using so orientation needs to be exposed as well because we are using the population. To, we are using the mesh uh, normals and tangents to decide what's going to be the orientation of the characters. So we are not only use it for the position, but we also use it for the orientation. So this is why both attribute needs to be exposed, and uh, if they are not exposed, as you've seen, you've got the error message. Uh, I know someone actually uh, said to me that I should look into the output log, but for some reason, I actually missed that error message. So great thing, it's working. Oof. So yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's almost eight on my side here. Um, I've noticed there were a couple of questions. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, they were all answered, but uh, if they are not, uh, let me know. Well, I, I don't see any open questions anymore. And I can see also some people uh, provide me some uh, advice with Unreal, either sequence or just have the nodes connect to each other in the order you want them to execute. Yeah, true. Indeed. Uh, it's true that I took the habit to uh, use the sequence stuff, but uh, it's true that rather than using the sequence, I could have just uh, connected. Let's stop here. Rather than using the sequence, just connected one after each other and uh, uh, that would work. And I don't need this anymore. Um, there are more tutorials on the website, uh, which will show you, you know, how you can uh, just um, uh, tackle uh, how to override various attributes. Um, and um, 
And um, yeah, you can uh, go through those. And okay, I just got a question. Could you point me to the grant annotation tutorial or run through it uh, real fast? Yeah, so if you want to uh, be able to uh, change ground adaptation, first thing we need to do is uh, first expose it. So as we need to change it, it means that we want to make it as a GDA attribute. So I want to go into my uh, GDD attributes editor. I want to go into the terrain. Uh, so there's a terrain shape in my scene. And I've got uh, ground mode, nav mesh mode, pin on ground, orient node. Wait a minute. Terrain. I probably need to first define. Yeah, okay. I probably need to first define a geometry here. So let's create a geo by default. And let's also create another geometry, which I will use into Unreal and which will be different. So that's going to be my source geometry. And that's going to be my destination geometry. So I'll make them slightly different. So for example, I'm going to sculpt the destination geometry. So it has a bump on it. And my source geometry will still be the same. So let's hide that one for the moment. And let's use the sort geometry within the Turing. Great, let's save the scene and let's go into the editor, go into the terrain node. And um, so as soon as you um, have a terrain geometry, now you end up with a, within the terrain shape, you end up with a geometry attribute, which is a mesh array. So we're gonna apply and expand this, right? So let's go into Golem, export this as a Golem digital asset once again. And if we go into the Golem simulation node here and we refresh it, now we've got a new element, which is the terrain geometry, which is a GDA mesh attribute. So we can override this attribute if we want to. And you can see that when we've got the value, uh, when we expand the value here, we um, end up with a dropdown. It drop down lists all the meshes which are available for the characters to adapt on. So here it lists all the geometry which is available in the scene. Uh, damn. Wait a minute. Okay, so I said that's the automatic um, blade closing program at 8 p.m. Right on time. Uh, so yeah, sorry, I was saying that here you got the list of all the meshes which are available. So if you want to override the actual terrain, what you just need to do is bring a geometry into your Unreal Scene and override it. So let's go into our actual scene here and uh, do a export selection as an FBX. So that's gonna be my destination train. Let's bring it into our scene here. Uh, content browser, import it there, import there, destination terrain with the right scale. Okay, hopefully it's there. Let's put it on zero, zero, zero. So it has the bump as expected. And let's go into the terrain and say that the actual representation of the terrain is now uh, something called, no, that's not the floor, right? That's this terrain, sorry. So you select the geometry that you want to use. And um, as you can see, here the characters adapt to that geometry. So as we are using the override uh, strategy of the node, we can see it right away when the, even before we launch the simulation. With the blueprint, as it's something which is executed because we connect it to the event, which is called begin play. So begin play only applies when we press the play button. So, so anything that you connect with the blueprints, that's something that you will have to um, uh, execute. You have to execute the scene to see how it happens, right? So now if I, uh, play uh, the simulation. We can see that the characters readapt uh, to that disk. But actually, if I bring that disk to a different position, so they can adapt to the terrain right away, like here and there. Now you can see that the position comes from the disk, 
but the ground adaptation comes from um, the terrain node that uh, the terrain geometry that we've been providing. Uh, it's not possible to access as a normal GSCF. I see the parameter in the Golem cache tool in Unreal. It has source and destination. That's uh, okay. That's a different workflow here. We're not speaking about cache replay. Well, we're not speaking about simulation anymore. We're speaking about cache replay. So those are different tools. So yeah, it's available uh, also in uh, cache replay. That's another workflow um, you want to use rather than using here um, the the terrain override because here we're overriding the simulation, so we compute the simulation. So it's a different process from readapting a cache because we are not computing skeletons anymore in the cache; they are already computed. Um, what you want to do is override um, the destination terrain, and that's something you can have access to with the export selection as Golem terrain. If that's not clear enough, um, I invite you to just open a new support ticket, and uh, you know we can speak about that uh, specific requirement. Uh, on uh, you know on a dedicated topic and uh, we can show you how that works, but yeah okay um, uh, I'm afraid that was not you know the 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 same workflow there. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, are there other questions regarding uh, uh, um, maybe what we've been uh, showing either the cache replay or the simulation replay with an Unreal? Um, if not, uh, the session will be probably um, once again be made available today uh, in low quality. Uh, through the Discord, and else you'll have a link tomorrow as well um, to have uh, the high quality probably tomorrow or the day after, uh, if I'm if I'm correct. Um, next uh, meeting that we're going to have is going to be um, the actual mixer. So if you guys want to, you know, create your own um, Golem Academy project, you'll have until uh, June. Fifth, I think midnight to submit it. Um, we've been sending information um, uh, by email, and um, on the June eighth, um, almost the same time that we had today, we're going to review uh, the shots. We're going to try inviting uh, some crowd TD from uh, various studios, and um, you know they'll be able to provide some uh, uh, pretty good feedback on the, on the work you've been doing. Um, yeah, sorry for the population tool uh, mistake that I made, and sorry also for not restarting Unreal. Um, clearly, I'm not using Unreal as much as I'm using Maya, so I, it takes me a couple of more minutes to uh, you know figure out, work around whenever different issues. Um, I think there's a second poll, if I'm correct, uh, regarding what we've been doing on the simulation parts. And um, once you're good with this, then I guess we will see. Uh, uh, we see you. On, we'll see you all together on the on June eighth. Any questions in the last minute? Go ahead. Um, and uh, regarding the person who was anonymous asking questions about the terrain, feel free to open the new support uh, ticket on support.golem.com, and we'll be happy to help you with this. In the meantime, you guys take care and uh, up to see you on the June 8th to uh, review the work. See ya.